Kerala Agricultural University, an NAR of top ranked university, is reputed on its farmer friendly research of global standards. It is also known for its research, education, and extension of international repute. Now we have Dr. Thomas Brown, who is the director of Max Planck Institute, Germany, and he's doing his research on regenerative biology and Max Planck Institute, which has 38 Nobel laureates already. And now he is an erudite scholar of residence program of Kerala State Higher Education Council also. Now we have his present in the Sanctum Sanctuarum, that is our College of Agriculture, Velayani. Along with him, we have Dr. Ajushankar, who is heading Department of Bioinformatics of Kerala University. And he can be termed as the father of the development of bioinformatics in the state. I mean, we all are indebted to him for the growth in the trajectory of bioinformatics in the state. And Kerala Agriculture University is, is proud to have both of you, sir, in this sanctum sanctuary. Well, I mean, first of all, I'm really happy to be, be here, Karela, and uh, really enjoy the hospitality. Uh, that was something that, that really uh, find amazing. And uh, I think, I mean, one needs to uh, connect. Uh, science is all about communication, to exchange uh, views and also to bring people together with, who at the first uh, glance don't seem to ha have so much in common. But usually that's not the case. If you dig a little bit deeper and if you look for principles, uh, if you look uh, for new ideas, I think if you just stay within your own realm all the time, I mean, then uh, new, really new ideas uh, uh, will not come forward. And uh, to interact with people that are a little, little bit uh, outside uh, of, uh, of the group that I'm normally interacting with is, is extremely stimulating. So, and uh, I also think, I mean, my, my own research, if you're asking for, for that, I mean, we are doing basic research, yeah? We're trying to identify new principles, but uh, of course, if we find something that is exciting and promising, like uh, stimulating endogenous heart uh, regeneration, I think this will be uh, something that will be picked up uh, by, 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 by other people, uh, bring this uh, to an application and really eventually then also uh, help uh, and improve uh, health and uh, cure disease patients. Dr. Thomas, welcome once again to this very beautiful campus of the Kerala Agricultural University here in Trivandrum in the village called Velayani. And the beautiful breeze, the canopy of the coconut trees. How do you feel to be in Kerala? Uh, for the first, I understand for the first time, a scientist from one of the top institutes in Germany. How does it feel to be in this? I mean, it's an amazing feeling. I'm uh, particularly impressed, uh, I've mentioned that already, by the hospitality that I have the privilege to enjoy here. So, uh, so many dedicated people are also, um, I'm really impressed uh, to see the devotion, the commitment of all the young students who uh, obviously invested a lot of time and effort uh, to prepare uh, this meeting here. A lot of thought obviously uh, went into that. This uh, cultural evening yesterday, I think gave me a very nice reflection uh, that they also have uh, just next to science, probably, and I hope for that at a slightly lower level, primary commitment mm -hmm. should be to, to science, but that they have a lot of interests and, uh, and that they also lift the Indian culture and then use that also as a type of motivation uh, to, to drive their professional careers. Talking about culture, I think, you know, culture, one of the key words is aesthetics. And in science also, I think there is an aesthetics. If you do science without aesthetics, you raise ethical problems. Uh, what's your take on that? About the ethical issues that the new, new sciences, you know, new biology, biotechnology, nanoscience. What, what do this bring on the table uh, as far as ethics is concerned? Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say that I'm slightly biased uh, by this, what I sometimes feel is an over-regulation uh, in Europe and, and in Germany. I mean, I, on the other hand, I'm convinced yeah, that one has to think about consequences and that also worst case scenarios have to be considered and discussed. On the other hand, if you over-regulate and, uh, and just because you are afraid and because you cannot, and what is 100% uh, in life, yeah, you cannot 100% exclude any, any negative outcomes, 
whether this should then be a reason uh, to, uh, to, to block uh, types of research. Uh, this is also something that I dislike. So I think it's a, it's a more balanced approach. And actually, my daughter is pursuing a career as a bioethicist. Yeah? She, oh. she studied medicine, but her interest always was, yeah, what, what are the consequences of technology uh, development? Are we moving uh, forward too fast uh, or too slow? I mean, in Germany, we have, for example, very strict regulation when it comes to embryo research, mm. which sometimes to me feels absurd. So we are, for example, not allowed uh, to do diagnosis on a pre-implantation embryo. Mm. So the pre-implantation uh, diagnostics where you remove one cell from the embryo, do diagnostics, and then implant. It's strictly forbidden. Mm. Once the embryo has implanted, mm. then you can take uh, a sample and then you can induce an abortion, mm. which is, of course, much more stressful and painful mm. for the mother. Mm. Yeah? Doesn't make sense at all. Yeah? Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's also part of the German history, yeah? this uh, uh, project yeah, to, to, to breed a superior race mm. uh, 70, 80 years ago. <laughs> yeah? And I mean, this uh, history has ramifications. Yeah? I'm just born from this idea I yeah, just forbid any any technology that can be used for selection. Mm. Although, of course, you can also use abortion as a means of uh, mm. selection. Mm. So, again, coming back, I think one should be concerned and one should do a thorough vetting of uh, potential negative implications. But to block uh, technology, I mean, in the end, it will anyway not work because other people who are less scrupulous uh, uh, will probably do it. Mm. But one should, uh, I think, in a little bit more open uh, way, uh, embrace uh, uh, the opportunities uh, and uh, also uh, then allow uh, controlled ways of, uh, of moving forward. I, I, I think uh, countries like Singapore, for example, yeah. they have a very differential kind of setting for this number of days on which, after which the embryo cannot be touched for research. And uh, they seem to be attracting researchers from other countries where, you know, the yeah. regulations prevent them. And so, as you said, it happens anyway, you know. Yeah. Might do. I mean, it also depends strongly on the religious uh, background. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. for Jews, actually, a baby is not a human being, only after it's born. Yeah? Oh. In Islam, for example, depends also whether these are Shiites or Sunnites. Yeah? Mm -hmm. They have, uh, I mean, this idea that uh, God uh, uh, just installs the soul at a certain time point. Uh -huh which interestingly differs between Sunnis and oh, Shiites. Yeah. <laughs> so until then, it's just uh, essentially uh, a mold of clay. Yeah? So nothing human. Yeah? Only after the soul has been installed by Allah, uh, uh, then it becomes a human being. So of course, yeah, very strong uh, uh, effects of uh, depending uh, I, on cultural background, religion. Yeah. I, I heard, uh, I mean, I, Chinese, my Chinese friends tell me that they reckon the age as one, when the baby mm. is born. Because one year, you know, uh, <laughs> in the mother's womb, and then they come out, they start with one. So, which is also like, referred to as a computer scientist, I see some programming languages, they start counting from zero. Mm. Uh, but you know, most human beings start counting from one. So, <laughs> something like that. So, so, of course, ethical issues are a very major concern lot of political upheaval mm. on, on uh, ethical issues. Do, do you, don't you think that there needs to be a constant kind of struggle between science and these regulators so that both do not go overboard? Is it not uh, fair enough that there is a continuing controversy? Yeah, I think it's fair and it actually also happens. I mean, views have changed, regulations uh, have changed. I mean, just uh, think about genetic engineering uh, in, in general. When this was uh, first introduced, I mean, these were actually scientists uh, who initially uh, uh, asked for a kind of moratorium to, uh, to explore first uh, potential threats and dangers uh, that might arise uh, from genetic uh, engineering. That was in the 1970s, right? Yeah, the uh, Asimola uh, moratorium. Mm -hmm. uh, so initiated by, 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 by scientists, uh, not by the regulators. Mm -hmm. 
But I mean, you cannot actually be uh, too surprised uh, about what uh, politicians and some regulators don't know. That was also uh, at this time when this uh, moratorium uh, was established. So uh, the uh, state parliament in Massachusetts, they had to decide about the regulation. And actually the policy makers, members of parliament uh, were asked yeah, by the scientists uh, just in preparation for this bill. So where do you think in the human body the DNA is located? Mm -hmm. Actually most of the politicians answered in the brain. <laughs> in the brain. <laughs> in the brain. At least, I mean, there was some idea of what's going on. Yeah, but I mean, but I think that's also what we have to do as scientists. Yeah, I mean, just uh, also bring knowledge uh, to the general popul population, uh, uh, make them aware of what's going on. That this is not some mystic stuff, but. Uh, that there are clear yeah. facts that you have to process. The public process. debate very many times may be uninformed. So, I am reminded of one student who, one politician who thought, who believed in principles of democracy, mm. because he read it slightly differently, for the people, by the people, B -U -Y, mm. B-U-Y, by the people. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Tell us something about your work, how, uh, how close is modern science to a regenerative uh, process of heart and lungs, you know, something that very eagerly uh, human, humanity is looking forward to. I mean, there are actually amazing uh, developments. I mean, I briefly mentioned that a colleague of mine is uh, just doing the first uh, clinical study of uh, IPS cell derived uh, cardiomyocytes uh, in a clinical study to be uh, transplanted uh, into human patients. So that study has just started uh, two years ago. I'm not so sure whether that will be successful. That's another ethical consideration, actually. Usually with these innovative uh, treatment regimens, you start that usually with terminal ill patients, yeah, where all the conventional means of treatment have already been exhausted. And that is, of course, uh, not an ideal situation. Yeah? So you might be well past a, a time point where you can, can still uh, do something. Yeah. But, I mean, it's also understandable. I mean, there are established uh, therapies, and first you want to use them and not something experimental. Mm -hmm. But that is not necessarily the best uh, scenario to test new treatment options. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm convinced, uh, I mean, I shouldn't be too optimistic. There have been a lot of these predictions here. We will cure cancer in 10 years, and it did not happen. Uh, but I'm reasonably sure that in 10, 20 years, we will see new therapies uh, that improve the condition. I mean, whether this is really a full reversal, full regeneration, okay, yeah. But I think there will be some, some progress and some benefits. So but these are at animal studies level, have they been tested out or you only focus? Yeah, on animal uh, levels, I mean, we usually uh, use mice. We're also thinking about doing studies in, in larger animals or so. Well, I mean, the physiology of a pig is much uh, closer to a, to, a, to a human compared uh, to mice. I mean, mice have actually a heartbeat of 600 beats per minute. Mm. Yeah, so yeah. 10 times our rate. Mm. So Striding pigs? Striding pigs? No, no, uh, uh, mice, mice. Mice, yeah. So therefore, yeah, pigs are much closer to it, yeah. uh, to humans. But, uh, I mean, in, in mice, we can indeed, I have to say, I mean, these are recent developments, but uh, there it looks like... Uh, uh, we can cure uh, uh, myocardial infarction. But I also have to say, I mean, these are young, healthy mice that are subjected then to a blockade uh, of the, uh, of the uh, main uh, coronary arteries. This is not the typical situation uh, that you face in human patients. Yeah? They usually have multiple diseases, they have diabetes, they have severe atherosclerosis, and then they have myocardial infarction, they are usually older, yeah? so uh, this has to be taken into account. And whether our approach, and that's also something that we have to test, would also work with, uh, let's say, a two-year-old mouse who is also suffering from diabetes, diabetes and, and have uh, also vessel diseases, we have, haven't checked that. Yeah? So these are also in the models that we have tested so far, certain limitations. Yeah? One, of course, always goes uh, for the low-hanging fruits, uh, <laughs> uh, for models where you can expect that things uh, work most likely. Uh, but the next step is yeah, to make it harder and, uh, and look also in situations where I it's not so. Speaking about models, you know, 
as an engineer, you know, I would like to know your uh, take on how mathematical models can be helpful in life sciences. You know, there is this project on the electronic cell where they are trying to model the cell as mm. if it were like a machine and how you model a motor or a uh, turbine or an engine. And uh, the very famous computer science professor called Donald Knuth in his retirement interview said that uh, computer scientists have 500 years of work left in biology to be doing all these models. Right. So, are you aware of this process? Do you give it any kind of a chance to yeah. help us? Yeah, I, I mean, with this 500 years, that's probably a realistic <laughs> <laughs> projection. Actually, when we were still working with these uh, new tree generation, I also actually wanted to hire a mathematician yeah, for modeling of limb tree generation. But, I mean, eventually, and that's, I think, really the major problem, so far, what we do in biology is usually not quantitative. Mm -hmm. yeah? And also, if you look at the quantitative data from different labs, they vary significantly. Mm -hmm. And my understanding of uh, mathematics is you need precise numbers. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You cannot use uh, just vague uh, determinants uh, for your modeling, which also requires then quantitative biology. Mm -hmm. yeah? And... Uh, that is, I think, something that, from the biology side, we haven't reached yet. Yeah? These are more qualitative measurements that we are doing. There are no real established standards. Everyone does it in a slightly different way with different quantitative outcomes. I, mean, I have a hard time to imagine how mathematics can, can cope with these problems. I mean, in engineering, it's much simpler. There are clear numbers, yeah. Mm -hmm defined environment mm. by biology. I mean, there are thousand millions of parameters and uh, you have to measure precisely each of them to do what I think is a proper modeling. So I think it will be difficult. It's dangerous, right? Yeah. 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 So possibly, uh, Donald Nutt had the you know, same take on this. That is why he's at 500 years. Yes. <laughs> minimum, minimum. Yeah. Yeah. No, Yesterday, that... during our discussion in BioZeon, I noted you were you, you thought it was people were just being over enthusiastic about yeah. uh, the gut microbiome. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I was from the context of the number of cells. Mm -hmm. I was yesterday also mentioning it. By mass, it's about one sixtieth of the body. Absolutely. But yeah. by count of cells, three times the number of cells of the human body. So, do you think that that numbers imply that they have to be taken seriously and their genetic makeup, genetic mutation, their genetic interaction with the human genome? And uh, do you look at the human human being as a whole system rather than a system of many organisms rather than just a... Uh, uh, back system. Yeah. Um, a human being exists in an environment, whether it's an exogenous uh, environment or whether this environment resides in, in our gut, in our intestine. Yeah? So, of course, there are a lot of interactions. And don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not overly critical. I'm just seeing a lot of uh, exaggerations okay, there. Okay. Yeah? And, I mean, how metabolites uh, from, uh, uh, from bacteria residing in our intestine uh, influence our learning ability and influence virtually yeah, all functions in the body. I mean, I have a hard okay. time uh, to, uh, to understand that. And also, if you look sing simply at this uh, complexity of the microbiome, which is pretty different between individuals, yeah? I mean, how should that, how should that work, yeah? If it's really such a simple deterministic uh, relationship. I mean, then, then each individual microbiome should have completely different effects. Yeah, so, and again, I'm, I'm rather critical. Actually, we are also doing such experiments. But, uh, I mean, the models that, that are used where you deplete a microbiota completely uh, from, uh, from the intestine, I mean, this is, of course, an extremely artificial situation. This never happens uh, in nature. Uh, so the whole mucosal immune system is co uh, completely untrained in, in, in such mice which have never seen any, uh, uh, any, any bacteria. And then you infuse bacteria or transplant stool uh, and, and see effects. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, completely unphysiological. 
I mean, again, I don't deny they are very good, very solid data, but also a lot of uh, exaggeration. So I had this example there with uh, liver steatosis. Uh, they are so fatty liver. And of, of course, this has a, has a, I mean, this is this typical situation here of, of a post hoc propta, uh, propta uh, hoc, yeah, so that, I mean, just by sequential events, you think there's a causality. So, I mean, of course, what you eat has an impact on, on, uh, on your liver metabolism and might also induce fatty liver. And of course, also bacteria in the gut depend on uh, what is uh, taken in. Yeah? So of course there's a correlation, but that there's really a causality mm -hmm. and that the type of, of uh, bacteria residing in our intestine is then causal whether one person develops a liver steatosis and the other not. Yeah? I think this is... Okay. People uh, should... I, I <laughs> I mean, that. <laughs> yeah. Even given the, uh, the kind of not purely established causality between mm -hmm. the gut microbiome and human health, uh, even given that it has some influence, uh, I, I, I was, I'm wondering that, you know, for example, there is a talk about biodiversity and how it has to be mm. preserved. I think inside that also comes the mm. diversity of the gut uh, microbiome True. and uh, how our food habits have affected it. You know, when I, uh, I was young, uh, my mother makes uh, yogurt. Mm. What do you call it in Germany? Yogurt. yogurt yeah. Yogurt. Here we call it curd. Curd. Uh, mm. Maybe the consistency is different. Uh, she would make it by putting a spoon of the curd of the last day. Mm. Uh, in the night she would put and then pour some milk which mm. is not hot. Mm. Next mm. day it will be. Ah, it ferments next day. Mm. So some days it goes wrong and then she says it didn't set well. Then it is it's completely quiet. thrown it's out quiet. and yeah. then what she does is, she asked me to go to my grandmother's house and bring mm. the uh, seed. Ah. Yeah. So today, so uh, so I look back, I see that we, we were actually having bacterial colonies which are very special mm. for different homes. So today it all comes from one place where the mil in Kerala it is called the Milma. Mm. So you, your bacterial diversity is actually compromised. So this is... If given even a small effect of the gut microbiome, mm. you know, does this have implications, you know, our food habits? Or I'm, I'm pretty sure it has, but yogurt is actually an interesting example, yeah, because, uh, I mean, nowadays, I mean, this industrially produced uh, yogurt, I mean, there aren't any living bacteria <laughs> inside anymore, yeah. Mm. It's very different uh, uh, compared to a traditional production where you indeed uh, ingested, I mean, I don't know with this plant here in India, mm. but in Europe and North America, I mean, mean there is no, 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 they're all dead. Yeah, so there are no no active lactobacteria bacteria inside any anymore. Yeah, which is yeah. So is that still real yogurt? But coming back to your question, no. I mean, also a, a very interesting if you look uh, uh, consequences. Uh, vegetarian food. Yeah, it's also quite interesting. Uh, Non-processed uh, food. I mean, there are actually also a lot of stuff uh, that is released uh, uh, from uh, from uh, primarily plant-based uh, food, which is actually pretty toxic. Yeah, so uh, 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 a lot of phenols, uh, uh, other toxic substances. I mean, it's usually then processed quantities, concentrations are not uh, not particularly high. Yeah. But I mean, people just advocating, not because of ethical reasons, uh, uh, just to completely uh, go for vegetarian food. I mean, of course, they don't know, yeah, or they ignore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there are, of course, major problems with, uh, with uh, animal-based food, no question. Yeah. But of course, this will have an effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Which I mean, you recommend? I, I think, I mean, the, the uh, human is, is a kind of an omnivore, yeah, okay. yeah, just balanced, uh, balanced diet. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I think whatever you feel comfortable with, uh, you, you should eat. Uh, yeah. Not excessively, <laughs> it's always okay. bad advice, yeah, but in a balanced way, I think that's, uh, that's uh, uh, probably best overdoing. Uh, actually, I had, when I was still working in a hospital, I had a patient who was a strict vegetarian for, for years, and then he also attracted malaria. Yeah? malaria. And then he ended up with a really severe vitamin B12 uh, uh, deficiency. 
And then he attracted a condition uh, which is a result of this, uh, the lack of vitamin B12, uh, which is called funicular uh, myelosis, uh, which is a, deg a degeneration of, uh, of some strands in, in, the, uh, in the spinal cord, which is irreversible. Yeah? So you get, uh, get then paralyzed and this wouldn't revert. Yeah? So, I mean, this deficiency vitamin B12 due to this high turnover of erythrocytes, uh, which was induced by malaria, then really gave the final push and uh, resulted. In. So, I, I mean, overdoing, uh, I mean, just a little bit uh, common sense, uh, just to be I there. think that, uh, that should uh, be. I also think if you take bacteria to be non, non vegetarian consumption, you know, nobody can be vegetarian. You know, you are taking yes. some yogurt or you are mm -hmm. taking. In India, you say this plant, Tulsi, is very divine. Mm. But you take a leaf of it, it might also have uh, <laughs> microbes in it. Yeah, I mean, that's why, we, ha that's why we have acid in our stomach. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, and you know, there is this uh, famous uh, story of, uh, of uh, Patton Kofa was a famous uh, a bacteriologist in the 19th uh, century. And uh, so, I mean, did a lot of good things, but he was not really convinced that the... Uh, that the cause for cholera is uh, vibro cholera, yeah? and he drank a little bit of it. Yeah? But doses matters, of course, yeah? and obvious, and he didn't get sick. Yeah? And uh, that was his proof that uh, vibro cholera is not the causing agent. Yeah, but I mean, you of course, neutralize most of your bacteria in the stomach uh, due to the very low uh, pH and doesn't do any harm. That, I think, happens uh, with a lot of bacteria that we ingest, uh, but, uh, well, if it's too much, uh, well, yeah, then they escape this first line of defense and then they get into trouble. So what do you mean? Is common sense would reign supreme? You know, most of the things that would actually, we would be able to come to a wise decision on many of these things. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I, I dislike, Science I mean, it, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, if you follow ideologies yeah, and then become dogmatic, uh, mm. I think, yeah, uh, particularly as a scientist, one should be yeah. a little bit more open-minded mm. and uh, consider pros and cons yeah. and uh, make an educated decision. So yesterday we, we also had this discussion about uh, machine learning. You know, to me, it looks as if the technology is now ready to learn anything, provided you give you sufficient amount of data. And data is the issue, and data is the oil, new oil, and you have a lot of ethical, just like research in, you know, embryo and all that, you have a lot of ethical issues with data. And uh, how do you see this going into biology, new biology? I mean, a lot of, there are very obviously useful things, but uh, there are also going to be some prognostics which would actually be not good for the society. You know, before the child is born, you, uh, you kind of, you're able to analyze. In fact, in, in this city, there is a company which says, you you give a drop of blood of your baby and we would say whether he or she would be able to learn three languages together. <laughs> so now we are, we are talking about the mar markers of uh, uh, learning, uh, of your creative ability, mm. maybe romantic ability. And, you know, I'm told there are dating sites which would say, you know, give uh, your, donate right. your blood and then we would uh, kind of tell you whether you would back. Is this new astrology? And <laughs> I, think, like astrology. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. And again, yeah, we talked about that. I think this is uh, another example of, uh, of a tremendous uh, exaggeration. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, of course, you can, can, can sequence, uh, obtain your genomic sequence uh, from, a, uh, from a drop of blood. That uh, not everything is hard coded, mm -hmm. uh, and the information uh, whether you are a talented uh, musician, uh, I think this cannot be derived simply from primary sequence uh, sequence mm -hmm. data, at least not right now. I don't know whether such mm -hmm. whether it's really as hard hard coded, uh, but I mean at the moment that is of course yeah, science uh, science uh, fiction. No, but I mean AI. I think it for me it's a tool. Yeah like many other tools, a very powerful tool. Do you see it going in a good way to support scientific research in your field? I mean, again, there are a lot of promises, uh, exaggerations. I mean, there's also, of course, this uh, sense of, uh, of a potential danger. Uh, and, uh, I mean, but it also tells you something uh, about the quality of, uh, of, of research papers when uh, some people are concerned that uh, yeah, uh, 
a machine learning program is writing your papers. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it tells you also something about the originality. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that an AI can can write a text. But I mean. I mean, my understanding of AI, and I'm an amateur, yeah, but I mean, it's mostly based on statistical uh, methods, Patterns right? Yeah, yeah. so things. you have to train a machine so that it comes close to what it has been trained with. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what happens if an AI has to deal with a situation it wasn't trained for? Yeah, so really something very far apart from the training data. Will it be able to make sense uh, of that? Or would it just create some kind of, of, of random uh, uh, yeah, uh, readout uh, out of that? And so, so I mean, for, for, for image uh, processing, yeah? also for crunching large data sets, organizing it, great. Yeah? But I mean, really new principle findings have a hard time to imagine that AI is up to that level. Maybe, yeah, if one trains probably also a, a program that is, uh, that is uh, meant to, to analyze uh, images uh, with uh, classical literature or classical music or the feelings uh, that, you, uh, that you have when sitting here. Maybe after such training sessions uh, it will be able, <laughs> but with the current level I have severe doubts. I, I, I sometimes wonder, you know, where is this heading to? You look at last 150 years or so, you know, industrial revolution. If you look at it positively, of course, it has given us all the kind of luxuries that we have. But I, I look at this person near my house. He has a BMW car, mm -hmm. which is in Kerala, very <laughs> prestigious <laughs> to have it. Or you have to be very rich to have it. He drives the car in the morning. Mm -hmm. He stops near the park in the city. Mm -hmm. Then he walks. You know? <laughs> So, you know, he won't walk. <laughs> uh, all, all the luxury has denied his body of the minimal exercise that he should have. So, I am wondering, you know, 25 years down the line, scientists don't have to think, poets don't have to be creative because the poems are written by AI. You possibly give it a prompt. So, then I suspect what would happen is that they would get up in the morning and do something very mechanical which they are not required to, but so that their brain keeps working. You like, say, the multiplication tables from 1 to 10 in the morning so that your brain gets some work. You know, uh, it, it looks as if we are working against the real well-being and happiness of the human beings. When you carry things too far, you know, they should be tools, they should uh, help us, but they should not rob us of the happiness that uh, our thinking, for example, what science gives us or even what arts gives us. That's the basic pleasure which has yeah. to emanate from you, has to go through you, has to be in your brain. What do you think about that? Yeah, I don't know, but I think, I mean, this has already happened in parts of our society. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you described uh, such an example and might become even more extreme. On the other hand, I'm not totally pessimistic. <laughs> I think human beings uh, have curious minds and I think eventually they will get bored mm -hmm. yeah? if it's just a mechanical repetition of, of things yeah? and nothing new. I think a lot of people will become bored. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there are a lot, also large areas in our society where people are obviously happy with this boredom yeah? and reproduce, have, have a very boring uh, idea about entertainment, uh, just... Uh, do things that uh, require the very least uh, uh, effort, yeah. So, but uh, so I think parts of the society will be affected by that. They will just uh, indulge in, in, in this uh, uh, type of comfort where they don't have to think, where they don't have to move, uh, they don't have to leave the bed, <laughs> yeah. But there will also others, I, I think, uh, who will just. Uh, keep the human flag up yeah. and... Uh, Very happy to hear that, you know, we, we, we need to be uh, thinking positively, not uh, merely looking at the negative yeah. side of it, and I think that is what human beings are. Just taking a small diversion from what we have been talking about. Uh, I th notice that you have been uh, with uh, academic institutions as well, you are now heading the cutting-edge research in Max Planck Institute. 
um, as a teacher, I mean, what is your take on teaching and in the modern time, and how you how you contrast your teaching happiness with the happiness in uh, research and development? Uh, that's actually a difficult question, also slightly unfair uh, question, <laughs> since I mean I was uh, teaching because I probably will give you a disappointing answer. Since I was uh, teaching medical students in biochemistry, I think they all hated me. Yeah? They yeah. usually, they all hated me. Yeah? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> since, I mean, medical students, I mean, usually uh, the, most of them want to become doctors. Yeah? Yeah. And they don't see any sense to, to, to dig deeply into biochemistry. It's very evil for them, that's it. Yeah, it's just a little bit of how can I use it later on. Yeah? I mean, I have a completely different opinion. I think that's what uh, separates uh, academic medicine uh, from some healers who, uh, I mean, just uh, get some instructions uh, from company representatives how to use drugs. I mean, they should really have used their own brain and understand. I mean, I agree most of this, uh, what, what I taught, will probably will have been forgotten in a couple of months. But at least, I mean, to, to, to have this basic uh, feeling, the knowledge, I mean, what's behind all of that. Yeah? But that's why, I mean, I never really enjoyed, I mean, there were a few exceptions, I have to say, but teaching such students, yeah, I mean, I that's, I that's now very different. I mean, when I do now teaching, it's mostly with graduates uh, who okay. have an interest in the subject. And uh, I mean, also for me, uh, covering the whole breadth of basic biochemistry. I mean, some, t some things I was interested in, some other things I found also pretty boring. Yeah. And I have to, had to, to, to teach all of it. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's a program, artificial intelligence program called ELISA. Mm -hmm. This was in the 1960s. Uh, it was a very mechanical program, not like chat GPT. Mm -hmm. It was like looking at the words that the person who typed in, mm. and then using that as a keyword, it mechanically said something back. But to the surprise of the programmer who wrote it, mm. uh, it was trying to do a psychological counseling. To the surprise of the programmer, a person who was sitting in front of it mm. and uh, was being counseled by the program, yeah. the person said, I don't want to talk to you, I'll talk to the computer. <laughs> and uh, the reason was that this person had something, some issue going on with his mother. Mm. And after a few sentences, he typed, the computer located that the word mother was mm. there. And it, uh, after listening to him for a while, mm. it uh, gave a message to him, tell me more about your mother. So now what I would like to ask you is, tell me about your mother. <laughs> Tell us about you. Yeah, yeah, but no, no, but but first, some, something else. I think now, as a as a teacher, and when you have only relatively few graduate students, and sometimes you are more a psychologist than as a supervisor, mm. yeah. you're, you're and to, and to yeah, yeah. yeah uh, to connect really to the needs and, and problems and and uh, of of people. I think that is also next. I mean, to to uh, yeah, providing hard facts. Uh, I mean, which uh, students can also pick up in, in, in textbooks. Yeah, yeah. But I think this is something to, to define priorities, yeah? also to motivate students. I think that's the prime uh, objective uh, a good teacher should have, okay. and not just mechanically. This can also be done indeed uh, by a computer uh, <laughs> a program. You say motivation is very important for a teacher. Uh, Absolutely. If you are unable to, 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 to raise motivation in your students' postdoctoral associates, I mean, then you are done. Yeah? And uh, this is absolutely critical. I mean, experimental uh, work is always frustrating. I mean, uh, generally experiments don't work. Yeah? So, and uh, rarely they work. And I mean, for, for people to keep on going, uh, this is tough. Especially for beginners, yeah, they think. I mean, they have a perfect setup; it should work. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, some parameters are wrong. You need to optimize. You cannot let it go until it works, or you come to the conclusion it's never going to work. But there's also fine balance. Yeah, if people just uh, stop before they have really tried hard, I mean, this is then your job as a supervisor to keep them or also to tell them based on your experience, uh, experience, well, probably stop it, yeah. It's not likely it's that you will succeed. perception that teachers yeah. are practical psychologists. Yeah. 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 More act like a guide than like a teacher. <laughs> right?
<laughs> yeah, but my mother, you asked me, was a very strong personality, very strong. I also, when I saw my father, I have to say, I mean, he died last year, 86, yeah, but, uh, but no, but he lived also a full life. But I mean, I, I found this quite uh, asymmetric relation, yeah. She was really the, uh, the, the strong person. Also, when I visit her, she's also 86 now. I mean, I have never actually seen that uh, my mother admitted uh, that she was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> she has her mindset and she has her beliefs and even if she is facing I mean, clear evidence that she is wrong, she doesn't care. Yeah, care. So it's kind of an adverse conditioning and never wanted to become like that. Yeah. <laughs> but more, <laughs> see, if I see evidence that I'm wrong, fine, I have no problems to admit I'm wrong. I have to correct myself. Yeah. But just stubbornly move forward, ah, no. <laughs> it seems she was like a reference point for you, but it was a reference with which you kind of distanced as, as far as that approach is concerned. Yeah. 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 Tell me, tell us also about the teacher who influenced you and, you know, some memory about it. Uh, yeah, actually, I mean, I was indeed influenced by a chemistry and biology teacher in gymnasiums or in high school. I mean, he was not really a trained teacher, interestingly. Yeah? So he did, uh, did uh, diplomas in biology and chemistry. Then obviously he didn't see a career in industry or in academics, so he decided to become a teacher. Yeah? But he had a different approach than these regular trained teachers. Yeah? So we are, I always had the feeling, ah, oh, it's trivial. I mean, his teaching was really based on, on facts. Yeah? He just explained well, and it was challenging. Some people, some of my, my comrades didn't like him particularly, but I liked him in the clarity, uh, how this, I mean, how he developed a problem. And uh, actually, have to uh, have to admit, I mean, he indeed influenced me. Uh, Sitting here, you know, I come after a very uh, tough day at my mm -hmm. department in the Kerala University campus in Karivatam. Coming and sitting here, I've just unmoved, you know, this breeze of the Vilayani Lake, you know, this, uh, seeing the, so much open space, mm. seeing this greenery, and the being in conversation with another very respectable mm. human being, it unwinds me. You're heading a, a very important research institute, I'm sure you have your cup full. How do you manage life and work balance? Yeah, this is uh, also another, and actually my wife also asked me, why do you do that to you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's indeed a deep uh, feeling of duty and uh, keeping things uh, floating. But sometimes I really wonder, I mean, all this, I mean, you're probably just referring to such uh, situations here. Yeah. I mean, you're constantly buggered with uh, stuff that is either trivial or nonsense, and and then they are addressing you. You should solve all of that, yeah. And I mean, I actually uh, went for for this uh, profession because I wanted to do research, mm -hmm. yeah, and not deal with all these trivial things and uh, with petty needs of individuals who obviously have no better things to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I somehow know, I learned, uh, yeah, one has to deal with that. Also keeping simply the people in your institute more or less happy. So if you ignore that, I mean, then there are, can be really uh, grave consequences. So it's this insight, yeah, that keeps me going for this particular part of the job. Uh, but it's nothing that I love particularly. Yeah, just, uh, and it's also, I mean, the attitude. Uh, I mean, just one example, different situation probably here in India. But uh, if you look at the number of people in our administration which are, who are on sick leave, yeah, this is constantly between 20 and 30 percent. Oh. Yeah. If you look at uh, scientists, it's usually zero. Yeah, even if they don't feel well, they come, of course, if they are seriously ill. Uh, uh. They, but it, it just, yeah, I mean, I, I think they also, uh, even if you work in areas where you probably don't get so much uh, rewards back, but I mean, you have to identify a little bit uh, with your institution. Yeah, you should be devoted to, uh, to that. That's, 
But I think I'm relatively soft person. Yeah, I'm definitely not a harsh boss. Yeah, but if I, yeah, uh, uh, but if I, I mean, of course, I can also sometimes <laughs> become a little bit more determined. But if I just minimally raise the level of my voice, yeah, then I know if I talk to someone in administration, this person will be sick for two weeks. <laughs> 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 just as a kind of backlash. Or, I don't know. Yeah, it's, so it's, it, it's difficult. I mean, employees uh, should, of course, be protected and uh, one should have uh, have a educated, civilized a way to communicate. But I mean, they should also be able to receive constructive criticism and not just completely black out uh, when that happens. Yeah. So it's not always fun to, 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 to head an institution. So my final question is, I do understand that uh, scientists of your caliber, your attainment, you're happy doing science, that I'm very sure of, otherwise you wouldn't have been doing science for so long. What else makes you happy, you know, even when you take a break from science, if at all? What makes you happy? What makes me uh, happy? I mean, reading a good book, also being with a family, yeah. Uh, things, uh, I mean, sometimes, uh, I mean, just doing simply nothing, uh, sitting there with family members makes me actually quite uh, happy. Just unwind and also, you know, yeah, just, uh, exactly. Uh, but also, I mean, to, to, to read a good, uh, stimulating book, nothing related to, to, to science at all. Yeah. I think that's... Uh, Is it fiction or... Yeah, it's uh, lit, lit, uh, liter uh, literature, uh, fiction. Uh, so not, not as I said, yeah, uh, nothing really related with uh, science. Science, yeah, but more for unwinding. I think I read enough science-related uh, articles. Although my feeling is, I nowadays uh, read uh, more or less exclusively grants and papers that I have to review than things that uh, really interest me <laughs> because I don't have the time <laughs> yeah. and, uh, just to, to browse a little bit uh, more freely. I think that's uh, it's actually also a consequence of this online reading that you only read articles uh, mostly nowadays uh, uh, of, of what you are interested in. I mean, I still recall, I mean, when you had an issue of, I don't know, Nature Cell, major journals, I mean, you look through that uh, from the cover page till the end, and of course you didn't read any everything, uh, but you, you just saw what's going on, and also sometimes uh, read an article that was not uh, just directly related to your field. But now, I mean, you can design your, your PubMed algorithms that you just uh, receive a continuous feed of papers related to your field, but I'm, I'm not so sure whether this is a good thing. Yeah. And again, I think really new stuff comes from when you're also exposed to, to unexpected things, yeah. and not just uh, being in a circle where everyone is just yeah, supporting theories, hypotheses, and it's, it's closed, a bit of a closed shop that one should avoid. I, I just would like to know uh, your students or your researchers, do they primarily publish in English or in German? Yeah. No, no, it's exclusively in English. English. But then you do face problems of their English ability in putting those papers together. <laughs> oh, indeed, indeed, yeah. I mean, I have actually quite a few uh, Chinese uh, PhD students and postdocs. Some are reasonably uh, good uh, in English, but others... And I think that's really not the major problem. So when I have to edit uh, papers, I mean, it's also despite many years of training uh, and also despite the fact that I try to teach them how to do it correctly and despite the fact that they have courses in their graduate program how to write a paper but I mean to develop a story yeah, just logical succession yeah. so figures are yeah, arranged in a logical way I mean if I get that even if the English is bad I mean this is much easier uh, than, mm. than uh, getting something which is completely yeah. scrambled yeah. up yeah. and this still happens yeah. I so, found that the science we could correct but their English is very yeah, terrible to correct, you know, yeah. if they, as you said, the, the logical sequence is lost and the language is like the tense is dancing and then you have a 
very serious problem. And scientifically, the work might be good, but finally, the story has. Yeah, to you have to yeah. have to communicate. Yeah, and and I mean, uh, people have so to read it, and it yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It in the world. yeah. No, no. I mean, there are some of my students where I essentially completely write the paper uh, new. I mean, it's also pretty uh, exasperating yeah, if you give it then back, and then they make uh, corrections, and then again, and again, and again. <laughs> <laughs> it's sometimes, uh, sometimes a uh, real, real challenge. Yeah. But it doesn't. Re I mean, I had actually also an Indian PhD student, pretty clever guy. Uh, had also a couple of major publications. But his writing. I mean, when he was giving presentation, good English. Yeah. But his writing, writing. awful. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't understand it. Yeah, because his presentations were good. Exactly. Good. Yeah. yeah. yeah but, Speaks well, know. but the yeah, writing. yeah, but the writing, yeah, it's also I mean these, I mean simple sentences. I mean you you are not uh, competing for a Nobel Prize in the literature, yeah. So <laughs> simple sentences, yeah, subject, <laughs> well, <laughs> not so difficult, yeah. But if you have then sentences going over over a page or so, yeah, and ah, it's, yeah, but I mean it's simple, yeah. But nevertheless, I mean to. Get people to to follow such advices. Sometimes, yeah. I don't know mm -hmm. what uh, prevents them <laughs> from doing it the proper way. Sending it. Yeah, when presentations. I mean, this is actually also much much better than it used to be. Uh, I mean, uh, the students are doing uh, presentations now from a very early career stage on, and if I listen now to to student presentations, they are so much better compared to. 20, 30 years ago. So this has definitely I improved. Doing I, I mean, I think they are doing really, really good job. And I mean, I was surprised, yeah, this self-confidence, uh, how they present and, and speak. Yeah, really but, uh, no, I found that really impressive. Yeah. Yeah. What do you prefer, research or to be a clinician? You are a good doctor also. You like research or to be a, like to be a clinician? Well, I mean, I terminated my my clinical career decades ago. Yeah, I started off also doing hospital work, and uh, but I mean, I made a very active uh, decision to to leave clinical medicine. A couple of reasons. So one was that I felt after a short time more as an administrator, yeah, challenging. Uh, patients into different directions, very repetitive work as well. Of course, I mean, there is this uh, human uh, level that you connect to patients. But I found it also, maybe I don't simply don't have the talent for that, yeah, quite difficult to, to communicate uh, with uh, patients. Yeah, so you invest a lot of effort explaining a condition, a disease, and in the end uh, you get this question, uh, yeah, will I recover? Yeah. <laughs> 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 and that after half an hour explaining the pros and cons, yeah. So I utterly dislike that. Yeah. Another thing was uh, this, uh, yeah, that you are always uh, in a hospital, determined uh, by by external events. You have very little freedom. You always have to respond instantly. Uh, there are nurses uh, coming in. Your boss uh, wants something. There are patients. Yeah, so you are always responding, responding. And you have very little freedom to do what you think is uh, is important. That was another aspect. Yeah, And I thought in research that might be different. Yeah, You have more freedom. Yeah. And uh, the other thing was actually also, at least at that time, but I think it hasn't really became, did not really become better. There was uh, this hierarchy in the German health system. You have the chief physician, then you have the superior physician, and then you have the, uh, the assistants, and very hierarchical system. Yeah. And um, I mean, I think in, in, in science, yeah, if you interact also with very experienced uh, uh, senior people, I mean, it's a different level. Yeah? And uh, it's not like uh, that uh, simply based on your position, you can, uh, can issue all types of, of, of simple crap and um, people have to accept it. I'll give you one example. Yeah? So I had actually a professor, pediatrics, and at that uh, time I was working in the pediatrics hospital uh, on the oncology uh, uh, ward. Yeah? And I mean, he was not an expert in leukemias at all. Yeah? And uh, nevertheless, he was supposed uh, to teach. And uh, anyway, so he, uh, uh, he wanted to explain to us that uh, T-cell leukemia 
is called T-cell leukemia because the uh, leukemic cells infiltrate the hair follicles, which is utter bullshit. Yeah. Sorry for yeah. the word. Yeah. yeah, Nonsense. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they have these uh, tiny little uh, protrusions yeah, looking like hairs, and that's why, why, why it's called. Yeah, but then I dared to say, Professor, are you sure that this is the correct uh, interpretation? And then he really crushed me. Yeah, so what? <laughs> I'm here. So I mean, this type of attitude. Yeah, I really, you still find it among a couple of clinicians. Uh, yeah, just uh, being the boss. I mean, that entitles you uh, to to uh, to all yes, kinds yes. of. Yeah, as if I mean, doesn't if I'm again if I make a mistake, I think. There is a need to correct it, yeah, and and I also ask always my people. I mean, if I do something wrong, if you have better knowledge, if you have better idea, you have to stand up. You have to tell me uh, face to face. I have a better idea. It's crap what you are <laughs> proposing there. And I think I mean this type of scientific exchange is absolutely instrumental. I mean, you can move forward in your own. Uh, uh, world, but eventually, I mean, this will lead to a disaster. You have to receive feedback. Uh, you have to also to to stand up to critical questions. It will just sharpen your uh, your ideas. So, next, regarding the opportunities of, for our researchers in Germany, what's your opinion? For researchers from from India, uh, hey, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Germany has also changed uh, dramatically. I mean, just take here uh, Professor Zuni Polamsetti. I mean, she started off as a graduate student in Germany. Now she has a full professorship. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, the, the 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 ranks are much more uh, uh, permeable. Uh, compared to, to, to 20, 30 years ago. And if you're an outstanding scientist, I mean, you have all the opportunities. On the other hand, I also don't think that it's a good idea yeah, to, to exclusively yeah, uh, promote kind of brain drain yeah, and uh, suck up uh, uh, the, the local talents and then utilize them for our uh, system. I mean, also there has to be an exchange yeah, that people come back uh, with new experiences. Uh, but I think there are a lot of uh, opportunities. Uh, and if people want to stay in, in Germany for whatever reasons, I think they have all the chances. Uh, uh. What about the higher studies opportunities for students? Yeah. yeah. Again, I mean, we there are many. We are looking for for talented uh, talented uh, students, and also, unfortunately, I have to say, if I look at the working morale of uh, of uh, German students, and uh, I mean, if they are already in, in job interviews, ask about work life balance and how many days of vacation uh, they are, they are getting. I wonder whether this is the right attitude. Yeah. And it's something that also came up increasingly, came up during the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. They hear it, of course, from the whole society. And But I think science is also passion. Yeah. And if you're not passionate of uh, when doing science, if it's a 9 to 5 job, I think it's a wrong job for you. Yeah. You have to go full in, of course. Yeah. Not twenty four seven. You need your breaks, of course. You need your vacation, but uh, but, but you have to have this passion. You know? And this is something I. It's disappearing, uh, and it's of course uh, uh, impact on the society, uh, uh, which uh, has a strong emphasis yeah, on, on this work life balance. Horrible word, actually, work life balance. Uh, I mean, your 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 work should be your life, yeah. <laughs> so. Strange. Yeah. So, sir, so let us conclude. We are very happy to have both of you, whose specialty is your passion for science, and your I will buy, rather say addiction to science. Yeah, it's yeah. it's also sometimes yeah. a drug. Yeah, yeah addiction so. to science, <laughs> and your uh, the way you promote the science for the betterment of the society, and all the effort that you took to come over here interact with our people, interact with the sir and his time he spent to come over to our campus to sit with you and for no, this message to our students, to our faculty and to all our people. We are really thankful to you sir. Yeah, thank you and thank again you. it was privilege and honor for me to receive this invitation. Sir. I really enjoy my time here.